Good morning, everybody. Thank the organizers for having me and for asking me to give a presentation on Gregor. Um, Wolfgang, is anything? No, some, okay. And uh, second, you know, I'm also quite grateful that I'm the first speaker because that relieves me from, from worrying about my talk further on. I can enjoy the whole meeting. That's a lot of fun. And third of all, I mean, I really feel very uh, grateful and uh, uh, to Michael, who has been a lifelong friend, and uh, to be here uh, in, in the honor of, the, um, of his, uh, how can I say, say his change in attitude towards work. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, to express this um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a good way. Um, I was asked to talk about Gregor. And I will perhaps say a couple of words about Michael's involvement with Gregor uh, near the end of my talk. I'm giving this talk on behalf of the staff at uh, the Kiepenheuer Institute, who for uh, many years has been working with Gregor. It starts with Wolfgang, and, um, but, and doesn't end here. But in order to prepare this talk, I have been uh, receiving a lot of uh, help from Lucia Klein and Thomas Bergefeld, who um, helped me put this together. First of all, I would like to remind you uh, how Gregor started. And there was a project uh, to which HAO actually has quite a lot of relation, which is LEST, uh, which survived for 20 years. It's the large European solar telescope. It was then uh, the uh, large Earth-based solar telescope. It uh, was alive during times when we have been students. And um, so it really... And encouraged us and, and, and got us interested into solar telescopes and, and engineering. Um, the last solar telescope uh, was a 2.4 meter telescope, 2.4 because the Hubble Space Telescope had a 2.4 meter mirror, and there was some hope to retrieve one of the spare mirrors for HST to actually use it there. Uh, it never surfaced, and the reason why it more or less um, um, died, I have to say, that the project was that in the end, the funding in particular from eminent European partners could not uh, be uh, could not be secured. But um, at some time, it has um, really engaged um, the solar community worldwide at large. And I remember that Steve McQueen, who has been one of the uh, directors at HAO at that time, was actually fighting for it. I was submitting um, with a, a lot of people, with the help of Bruce Lights, if I uh, remember correctly, um, submitting proposals to the NSF to actually secure some um, some U.S. Um, funding for the list, but uh, uh, that never happened. Hello, everybody. Um, the legacy of uh, LEST uh, is something which has to, uh, to do with Gregor, because the optical design of what uh, then in the end became the, the, the LESS telescope, uh, was a Gregorian design um, with um, three imaging mirrors, uh, which was conceived by essentially Richard Dunn, Dick Dunn. And some of um, you probably remember Dick. He, he died, when was it, 15 years ago? Thomas sort of shrugs, he, he doesn't really remember. Um, but I think uh, Dick has been one of our, uh, also of our, of our teachers in, um, in uh, telescope optics and in, in, in solar physics and uh, solar technology. And uh, near the end of um, LESS, there, there was the idea, let's build a, um, a precursor telescope with a diameter of 1.4 meter. And this is what essentially then be, later became Gregor. The uh, idea of the optical design was taken over by us in the late 1990s, early 2000s. But another concept of LEST, which we abandoned, uh, uh, namely uh, to have it uh, a closed telescope, which was not evacuated, but was helium filled. Uh, evacuation of a solar telescope was a big paradigm at that time. Um, was helium filled because um, you, um, you needed a thin entrance window, the thick one uh, could not be afforded for, uh, of this kind of size of aperture. Uh, then later became uh, something uh, which was realized with the Themis telescope in the Canary Islands in, in Tenerife. Um, so if we look at the designs next to each other, this is what we see. 
and we have to the left the to the left the the less design where with the light entering the telescope a primary focus over here secondary mirror over there uh, the, the, with a secondary focus at the um, cross intersection of uh, the azimuth and altitude axis and then a re-imaging mirror which then goes through a folding mirror through an optical train into and the, the room below the telescope. And this is pretty much what has been realized with Gregor. I'm going through a little bit through the optical design uh, later on. Uh, Gregor was then built, let me just see if I can go back here. Um, Gregor was then built on the Canary Islands on Tenerife in the building of a telescope which has been um, erected in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s, and which housed the Locarno telescope of the Göttingen Universität Sternwarte. And that's the building that you see here to the right. As it looked like at that, at that time, there is a, a dome with a slit in, on top, and there is this, uh, um, this thing which looks up here at the northern side, which is the top of the elevator. Um, and all of that had been uh, taken down. The whole uh, building had been uh, re uh, redone. Um, the project has been carried out by um, the Kiepenau Institute, the Universität Sternwarte, and the Astrophysikalisches Institut in Potsdam uh, with 50 and 25, 25% shares. And the total cost was uh, somewhere around 12 million euros. And we had an inauguration of Gregor in, uh, in 2012 here are just a couple of pictures. It was a very nice day. The uh, dome, which was then replaced by a folding dome, uh, opened up, and then somebody put a lot of balloons in there, helium filled, uh, which we weren't aware of. So we are all were surprised that all of a sudden there were these many balloons. And then uh, in the end, uh, you would see the telescopes with the visitors there looking at the sun, and you see this uh, sparkling glint. Of uh, the secondary, of the primary focal plane, um, at the Gregor Telescope. Um, this is not the right presentation. I'm sorry. This is the old presentation. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm surprised because that's, that's not the presentation which I just submitted. I, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it has the right subline, but that, uh, that, that everybody, every other, other talk had that. I just worked on that uh, this morning and this, I just. I mean, today it's. Das kann doch fast nicht wahr sein. Ist das, ist das die. Ähm, guck, guck mal in diese Google Docs. Ah, ja, komm. Ah, er kommt. Aha. If you could just recheck the Google Docs document, that's, maybe you can. That's the one that you told me was the right one here. Let me. Excuse uh, yeah. Me. I just go get my other glasses because I'm having problems reading things from the screen. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, because um, you have a, a strong heat load on the secondary mirror, all of the sunlight which uh, goes on, on the primary mirror. between the primary mirror and the, ca the Cassegrain mirror and relatively short, then you would need a large Cassegrain mirror, which gives you a, long, uh, 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 a large uh, central obstruction. That's something that you don't want. Or you make it uh, the distance, uh, um, the focal, uh, then you have a small Cassegrain mirror, and then you have a lot of heat light because you get it uh, all of the sun. And in the Gregorian design, you have the field stop or a primary focus in between where you can put a field stop where you reduce uh, the amount of solar flux by uh, 95 plus percent. 
Es müsste 118 Megabyte haben oder so etwas. Ja, ja, das sieht mehr danach aus. Ja. Okay. Sorry about that. How, oh, oh, we are back. Okay, fine. Thank you. So, um, just to give you an overview, the optical configuration, as we have seen, a Gregorian with three on-axis mirrors. The effective focal length is 55 meters, or the focal ratio is about f40. And the nominal field of view is 150 arc seconds, two and a half arc minutes. The primary mirror has an aperture of 1.5 meters. The focal primary focal length is two and a half meters. So it's a pretty steep primary mirror. And it was made from zero dual, and we use active cooling to make sure that the mirror seeing is not a problem. And that is actually something which works very nicely. The wavelength cover coverage is planned uh, from 350 nanometers, that is uh, near UV, to near infrared. Uh, we could access the thermal infrared, but uh, in the optical design, we have two windows, glass windows, which we have to take out for that in order to uh, make uh, the optical path transparent for that. And these two glass windows, they cover up uh, the Coudé train, which otherwise would become um, a problem. There's a foldable dome. You see the closed dome up there, which was built in Holland. And uh, what we wanted to achieve with that is that whenever the telescope observes, we would like to have the telescope in free air being, um, being um, flushed by uh, outside air in order to avoid any kind of dome seeing. And that also allowed us to use a reflective primary uh, focal stop, which essentially just reflects the light out of the telescope, never to be seen again, and doesn't hurt anybody. And that also uh, was a concept which works. Um, we have an integrated adaptive optic system and um, three post-focus instruments, and I'll come back to that later. Here you see then the telescope as it's open, you see that the dome fully folds down. And this was, uh, from the beginning, the idea that we were pursuing with this. Um, once again, the optical design, I'm not going through all of this, except that from the, um, the tertiary mirror onwards, we have a flat folding mirror over here. Here is one of the entrance windows. And all of that is enclosed in a tube system, which uh, guides the light through the telescope structure into a room which is below the telescope. So we have folding flat mirrors here. And this uh, beam here is on the azimuth axis. The beam up here is on the elevation axis. So, um, so all of this rotates. And uh, you have to take all these rotations into account if you want to figure out later on uh, how the image is located on the detector. Um, uh, of course, the movement of the NLTAS telescopes uh, causes the, both the pupil and the image to rotate in, um, in the laboratory down there. And that was something that we wanted to have corrected. We want, uh, for instance, to have the orientation of an entrance slit of a spectrograph constant during observations. And for that, there is a configuration of three mirrors, uh, essentially a mirror dove prism. Um, which can, can be inserted, but also can be extracted, and which is then used to derotate the image or the pupil or whatever you want. So there's a separate controllable device down here. The adaptive optic system used to be, and I'll come to that later, on a vertically mounted bench, pretty much like the adaptive optics that we have at the vacuum tower telescope, with a tertiary focus over here. So that's the final focus in the laboratory, or the first focus in the laboratory, with a re-imaging set of optics, a tip-tilt and deformable mirror, another camera uh, mirror coming uh, over here, and then a final science focus at the position of F4. And here we can put all instruments that uh, we have at Gregor. And well, this picture again shows this target, uh, this uh, glint at the primary focus, uh, if you're standing on the right spot. And um, there is a road which passes by the Teida mountain, which is, um, uh, which is westward of uh, the observatory. Um, at 15 kilometers, you can see the observatory in the distance. And if Gregor is open in the morning and looks at the sun, then actually the light from the target glint is reflected into that direction. And you see a bright star at the horizon. 
It's a wonderful sight. <laughs> Thomas has seen it. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know. I mean, uh, we didn't uh, do any statistics, but the light which goes out, which goes off uh, the primary focus, you know, is very is diluted very rapidly. So after a meter or so, it it doesn't hurt anybody anymore. So people are too much concerned about reflected light light reflected out of a telescope. This gives you an impression of the size of the field of view of Gregor with respect to the full disk of the sun. And uh, this is uh, the size of a detector in that field of view of one of our cameras. This is one of uh, the pictures that we have taken relatively early on in, uh, I think, in 19, uh, in 1213. That was during our initial science phase. And here is a high resolution image of that spot in the middle. It's one of, uh, I have to admit, one of the best images which we received. This is at 656 nanometers. And um, if uh, this is, of course, not a direct image, it is like the images that have been done with the DKIST. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, um, mildly massaged in order to get out the detail. And uh, if you analyze that, then you discover that actually the reconstructed point spread function is close to diffraction limit. And this is uh, essentially a result which we achieve. Um, I'll come back to that later. Um, the initial set of instruments, and there were three instruments, um, an infrared spectrograph, which is shown here in red, um, a fabry perot interferometer, um, which uh, is configured as a spectropolarimeter, um, which is shown here in blue, and then BBI, which is just um, a multi-wavelength uh, camera system, which is shown also here in light blue. Uh, this show, shows roughly the wavelength coverage of these three instruments and the, the, uh, the field of view um, as the upper limit and the resolution, at least the diffraction limited resolution uh, shown at the, as the lower border. So um, in the blue, we would um, have a resolution which is slightly better than a tenth of an arc second. And so far, we could uh, demonstrate OP by 0.8 arc seconds and with that result that, uh, that I've shown you earlier. If you look at spectral resolution, this is what uh, we have uh, here. I'll come to what uh, KFPI means uh, in a little while. So uh, the resolution is of the, uh, is, a few, uh, is of the order of 10 to the 5 to 2 times 10 to the 5 for the spectrographs. And of course, the broadband imager just takes images in narrow uh, spectral bands, but typically, but the spectral bands which would not resolve a spectral line. So uh, we just use interference filters there. Um, the, the telescope was conceived in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I remember the discussions that we had uh, when we started talking about Gregor. Um, we originally wanted to take out the, um, the old Gregory Codet telescope of Göttingen and replace it with a one meter telescope, which um, we felt would become available and then later decided that this will not be a one meter telescope, but we just make it as big as we can get it. And um, that turned out to be, to be not more than 1.5 meters. And I had, a, had I had it my way, Phil, where's, where's Phil? Here, you know, at some point in time, we had the opportunity to actually make the mirror 1.7 meters. But then I was told, no way. <laughs> that was uh, when you just started your telescope with 1.6 meters. I said, OK, good. Um, Ambitions and realities. We had we were very ambitious when we started. We wanted, uh, first of all, to have an open telescope that was still, uh, at uh, that time, uh, was a, a big discussion. The paradigm was evacuated telescopes in order to avoid um, instrumental seeing. Um, we wanted an open telescope um, because we simply wanted to avoid uh, all the problems that we would have with an entrance window. It simply turns out entrance windows are a stupid thing to do. And uh, the people who demonstrated uh, to us that was DOT, which was quite successful, although it was a 50-centimeter telescope. 
And uh, so we more or less just jumped into the cold water and said, we're going, we're going to make Gregor an open telescope with a foldable dome, just like that, in order to, uh, to, uh, to control the seeing inside the telescope. Um, we needed to, um, to do something about mirror seeing. And here we actually introduced backside air cooling um, in the end. And that, up to now, works with very good results. So we essentially have no problems with mirror cooling. And the third big ambition that we had at that time was, well, a silicon carbide was an emerging, uh, seemed to be an emerging technology for telescope uh, optics. And uh, because of its uh, thermodynamic stability, um, this, you know, it, it wouldn't, it would deform under heat, but it would uh, keep, uh, it, uh, it would thermalize very rapidly as opposed to zero dual, which has low thermal conductivity. Um, we uh, felt that uh, this is a technology that we should uh, try to do, and that more or less failed miserably. Uh, by now, we have all silicon carbide mirrors are replaced by zero dual optics. The last one of that one uh, has been the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror of the telescope is a salad bowl. So it's very steeply curved. It's an ellipsoid mirror because you, real, uh, you um, uh, relate the primary focus of the telescope into the secondary uh, focus of the telescope. as two finite focal distances, and that's best done with an, an elliptical shape. And um, we had, it took us years to get um, a zero to a silicon carbide mirror made, which would also fulfill the requirements that we had on mirror, on, uh, of, of course, mirror quality and on the weight of the mirror. We could not afford to have a mirror which weighted more than 10 kilograms because it's attached to a tripod, and the tripod would start drifting if uh, the mirror was too heavy, if the load was too heavy. So there was uh, a requirement. We got CESO in southern France to do the mirror for us, you see. Um, the mirror um, blank over here, or the, the final mirror, uh, yeah, the final mirror blank over here, and down there you see the mirror, uh, and it's mounted in the telescope, and that um, worked very well. Um, if you look at this picture, this shows the surface maps of the old silicon carbide mirror and the new uh, zero dual mirror side by side. And the problem that we had with the silicon carbide mirror was not that it would not fulfill optical specifications, at least not the ones that we had at the time, which were related just to an RMS figure, but all the optical residual errors was at small scales. And that was at, at scales which could not be resolved with our adaptive optic system and therefore could not be corrected. And this caused um, a lot of trouble in doing high resolution imaging with a new mirror that was actually a paradigm change. And if you look at these images here, this show the overall error of the telescope uh, up to the, uh, the fourth focal plane. So going through all telescope optics and uh, before and after the replacement of the mirror. And uh, what you see, these ring-like structures, they come predominantly from the secondary mirror. So all in all, the, the errors were not really terribly, uh, terribly bad. Otherwise, we would not never have accepted the mirror. But um, that's a story for uh, a couple of beers, I have to say. So here we really learned about that. Um, this has been replaced by um, then something where you don't see this anymore. And the only residuals that you see here are from the processing of these images, which uh, leave some, uh, some marks there which have nothing to do with optical aberrations. So that is a problem that has been solved. Another problem that we had took a while to discover. Um, we wanted to figure out what actually is, uh, we were always discussing dome seeing. So seeing at the telescope build, uh, at the building, and well, um, it ended up with uh, one of our colleagues putting plastic stripes at the, at the banisters, you know, and, and watch how they, how, 
how they float around. And I got so angry about that at some point in time. I want a real measurement. So we put anemometers, which measure actually sound, with, uh, with, uh, and, and which actually measure wind speeds, and which can be configured to measure optical turbulence, which is um, measured in C, uh, the unit is, no, not the unit, but the quantity is called CN squared. So that's what everybody uses when, when, uh, when you want to discuss seeing. And we put uh, one of them on the south side and the other one on, at, at, the, um, at the north side of the building. And uh, we had a, a third measurement, which was in between the vacuum tower and the Gregor telescope. So we could monitor the CN squared for a couple of months uh, in parallel at, at all three locations, day and night. And what you discover is that the free turbulence, the one between the two telescopes, is the green line over here. That shows a very significant increase. I mean, this is the time of day going from uh, midnight to midnight. So 12 o'clock here is noon time. You see a raise of that. It then, um, um, it, it then uh, culminates at around uh, 15 o'clock um, universal time. The local noon uh, is shifted from that, and uh, I just don't, don't remember now how much, but it's a little bit later. It's like 1 or 2 o'clock is, is, is local noon. And then it goes down again, and that's what you expect from ground turbulence, which then happens to actually raise up to 30 meters. On the north side of the building, that's the red curve, more or less mirrors that. The southern side goes way higher. And that was something which more or less disturbs us because we are looking over the southern side of the building, not over the northern side of the building. So um, the blue line comes from the southern sensor, and the, the red line comes from the northern sensor. And uh, here you see the difference uh, between the C and squared values or the factor um, by which the C and squared value, uh, values are increased with respect to the green line. And there you see you are somewhere, uh, somewhere around 1 on the northern side, but a factor of, of around 10 uh, and, and, and more on the, uh, on the southern side. And that uh, needed some explanation. And we discovered that the facade of the telescope, which used to look like this, um, actually uh, was the likely cause, uh, cause of this problem. Uh, the facade, when the sun hits on it, heats up uh, to you know, very high temperatures as long as the wind doesn't blow directly on it. And this is the eastern facade. And most of the time, when we look at the sun, the wind comes from west and northwest, so just from the other side of the building. So we're looking at a cloud of hot rising air uh, which, which uh, was caused by uh, uh, the building. So what we then did is, was to replace the facade, as you can see here. On the eastern side, this and northern side, this was easy, and on the southern side, it was relatively easily done using a crane like this. The western side still is awaiting a replacement because there we have to go through much more trouble in putting, uh, uh, in, 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 in putting a gerüst, um, um, a scaffolding up there. And uh, that is something which we still need to do. And now it looks like that and uh, has improved quite a bit. Today, what we are getting looks like this. This is from last year. And uh, the wavelengths that we show here are relatively close to what DKIST has recently shown, which was 785, if I remember correctly. It was 706. Seven or seven, six, oh, so they were both, yeah. And the reason why I, why I show them here is this is just you know, an ongoing moving of a series of reconstructions uh, we did at these wavelengths. And um, if you look at them, you see the difference between a 1.5 and a 4 meter aperture, but essentially not more than that. And the difference is in, be in these little details that you see here. I wanted to put up a picture for our web page where we have a DKIST. We have to talk about that, how I can get it some data if, if that's possible. But let's do that with all the data. And we are getting um, 
very good results now with Gregor, also at other wavelengths. This is from the slit jaw camera. And um, so the, um, the improvements which we have done have actually um, um, made the telescope much better in producing and, and, and generating high spatial resolution. Um, a couple of other improvements are in the course of being made. Um, we are replacing the user interface. Um, and the only reason that I show this here is for those people who have ever been to the Gregor telescope and used the, um, the GUI, which was you know, an excellent engineering tool and was also meant to, uh, to be uh, like that, has now been replaced with something where everything that you need to do to control the telescope is at your fingertips. And I think that's an improvement for everybody who, uh, who runs the telescope. There are a lot of uh, little details which are being, have, have been improved there. Um, we are also reworking on um, the suite of instruments that we have. Um, we have um, the, the infrared spectrograph. We have a fabi perot interferometer, which is being maintained by IEP. And uh, we have the broadband imager, which is uh, um, the instrument that has been built by us, for essentially verifying the telescope. Um, we are designing an imaging spectropolarimeter. That's Lucia's work. Um, we uh, also have, uh, um, have discovered that the, um, the situation or the, the, the way how we distribute light, which was essentially one instrument at a time being addressed by a rotatable mirror, was not optimal, and that we should actually take the, um, the, um, the what Dikis does and have a distribution system of light. So what we are looking at here is a new configuration of the optical table. I'm quickly going through this here. And uh, there will be the new instrument. There will, uh, we have no, no design, not, uh, we didn't put, put a drawing for GFPI up there. Um, we are essentially just reconfiguring everything and putting the adaptive optics on, on, on horizontal tables rather having one uh, vertical table as we used to have that. And this is how it's going to look like. At this time, everything has been taken out in the, image, uh, in the optics lab and it's currently being uh, redone uh, and rebuilt uh, like, we are, uh, like, like it looks here. And um, so in the future, Sorry, let me go back. Uh, this will be the new configuration. What will stay as it is, is the input uh, optics of this. We don't touch that because that is um, connected to the spectrograph below the table, but all the rest is being rebuilt in such a way that we can use everything which is here in the instrument floor uh, more or less in, in parallel. Um, we have an adaptive optics system. I'm not going to go too much about that. Um, the system has 20, uh, 256 actuators, uh, deformable mirror and tip tilt, a wavefront sensor with, a, uh, with um, a certain size, which I've been using for all, um, the, uh, all along and which has worked so far nicely. Um, what we uh, also have is a wavefront sensor, which we use for nighttime, where we can uh, put planets on. And uh, this is also what Gregor has been used for to look at planets and to do actually uh, Stokes maps of uh, solar system planets. And oh, yeah, okay. And <clears throat> we uh, we are going to uh, to modify that to some point that we are looking at wavefront sensor with larger fields of views, um, new wavefront sensors which have an. Uh, and much better performance. And uh, another thing which is, in, which is interesting, which we are working on uh, for quite some time now, is an adaptive optics wavefront sensor which can actually look, actually look at prominences of the solar limb. So this is something relatively new that we, wanted to, that we want to try out. Okay, um, this is the GUI of the adaptive optics system, I, and which uh, also hasn't changed much. The only reason why I show this picture is the nice little black dot that you see here in the middle is not a sunspot, it's mercury. So we've been looking at mercury uh, recently and got very nice results about that. Um, yeah, one uh, change that we do here is that the, um, this is the new configuration of um, the, uh, the op optical bench. Then we have the 
tertiary focus over here. And what, is, what looks so big here is just a relatively small uh, mirror, which is, uh, used to be a toroidal mirror, it's, and, and, and it's now going to be replaced with a, a parabolic, an off-axis paraboloid mirror. Uh, here is again tip-tilt, deformable mirror. And then we have again a camera mirror over here. So we have the focal plane at the entrance of the spectrograph. And in this, in, in this regime, we can then take uh, out light and put this into all other uh, directions. Um, we uh, also this. Yeah, I'm not going through. Uh, going to go through this. This is the uh, new instrument which we uh, uh, put up there. The science goal is fast chromospheric and photospheric spectropolarimetry. The spectral resolution is slightly smaller uh, than uh, that of uh, the GFPE because um, the speed is here of uh, of uh, importance. So we would like to get and scan the, 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 the spectra rapidly and need to collect in, the, in our photons. The wavelength coverage you see here, it's a 60 arc second telecentric uh, design and it uses uh, FLCs for uh, polarizers and again cameras with uh, a high frame rate. The next thing that we want to do is uh, multi-conjugate adaptive optics. This picture is stolen from Dirk Schmidt's uh, paper. But since we collaborate on that, I think I can do that. Is this moving? It's not moving, right? Used to, used to do that. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's slow. Um, we, are, um, we also want to equip Gregor with an MCO system. So into that system, we will integrate an M, um, uh, several deformable mirrors. In principle, how this works, I would like to show in this picture. This is still the old uh, optical setup. But what's going to be new is a reconfiguration of the optical beams over here. And there's a cluster of four deformable mirrors, which is, what, which is about this big, uh, with 200 actuators, uh, which are rel in a relatively close configuration and which are conjugated to 2 kilometers, 4 kilometers, 8 kilometers, and 20 kilometers along the line of sight of the telescope. So they can cover essentially all ranges that you need to cover uh, for a large ranges of uh, solar zenith distances. That's why you have the 20 kilometers. Okay, I would like to conclude my talk with a couple of statements. The improvements of Gregor since its inauguration has rendered it optically close to diffraction limited throughout the visible spectral regime. With Gregor becoming operational, Gregor is, will be the fourth largest solar telescope worldwide. Um, after the Guri Solar Telescope, and of course DKIST, there's also a 1.8 meter Chinese solar telescope, which interestingly is not operated by solar physicists, but by a technology team who is into adaptive optics. And I think it's fair to say that Gregor will remain at least for the next couple of years, the largest solar telescopes covering the European longitude range. I'm trying to put this carefully. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that Gregor will ready to become one of the most productive solar telescopes, as the VTT, the Vacuum Tower Telescope, has been in the 2000s. Thank you very much. Oh, Michael, I wanted to say something about uh, your involvement. You have already been at HAO when Gregor was there, but I think you helped us along in particular with uh, making sure that we stay close to the U.S. community and to encourage uh, not only us but also the U.S. community to, um, you know, well, let us participate in DKIST and, um, you know, let the U.S. community participate in Gregor. I remember those times very favorably. Okay, thanks, Oscar. Do we have